Well, we've got it. Anyway, I want to start by saying something about this particular area of London is very special to me. Ten years ago, excuse me, ten years ago and one week, my son was born in UCL over the way, and he nearly didn't make it. He was born, he was born grey and lifeless, and his heart wasn't beating. And it was a moment that changed my life. I spent two weeks walking around the streets of this area, literally soul-searching about what was the point of my life. What are we here for? Why am I so... Why can't I cope with how I feel about my powerlessness of my boy nearly dying and my powerlessness of my wife going through horrendous trauma and then exploring my own feelings of you know, how the birth trauma affected me? And I gave up my job. I was a magazine editor at the time. I gave up my job and I became a stay-at-home dad, which is far harder, as any stay-at-home dad will know. And I was literally uh, uh, the only man I felt marooned in a sort of world where I wasn't welcome. And I started to write about this, and I explored it, and that was my beginning. And that beginning happened like 100 yards away. And at the time, all I felt was, I just want a hug. I just want somebody who understands how I feel to try and help me. And that's you lot. All of us in this room, you know, share the passion of helping to understand how men and boys think and helping to try and improve our lives. And I want to underline how important the Male Psychology Conference is. Because every time I come here, something new seems to happen. We seem to meet new people. We get fresh ideas. This idea um, was largely born out of that. And can we just please join me in, in thanking Martin Seeger and John Barry for putting this amazing conference on. Thank you. Because really wonderful things happen in this, in this little room, this little corner of academia. We're all blown together with a shared passion. And that's where the Harry Project came from. So regular viewers will know that with John Barry, um, I co-wrote the Harry's Masculinity Report. Harry's, by the way, if you haven't switched to Harry's, a razor brand that actually cares about positive masculinity, not like those idiots at Gillette, <laughs> right, who want to talk about toxic masculinity. So what is the Harry's Project? Well, it's a piece of AI. We, we did a piece of work at Harry's where we discovered an amazing breakthrough moment that when men who were going through difficulties were offered the opportunity to talk to a chatbot, a piece of software, on their smartphones, um, or they were offered the chance of talking to talk to some AI that was monitored by humans, they were three times more likely to talk to the pure software. Now, you might say, oh, pathetic, Dr. Google. You know, why can't you talk? Well, the baseline for this was, Instead of trying to change the way men talk, why don't we change the way we listen? And where we listen, and how we listen, and when, what time of day we listen. AI proved to be a real key to, to unlocking really, really intimate conversations. So, so we built this platform, which still exists. You can have a look, by the way. That's the URI, URL, harry.ai. It's still there, so you can play around with it. We asked um, over 2,000 British men of a great age range to rank their lives out of 10. How content were they with their, their work, their relationships, uh, their health, their sense of purpose, their life satisfaction? And then we asked them, what makes you anxious? What keeps you awake at night? And we asked them not only to score it, but we asked them for open response questions. And then the really clever bit was that the AI was able to aggregate all those words and, and pull out trends. And what we got, I think, was one of the most intimate, raw, honest, and, and revealing conversations of British masculinity, uh, which created a huge media point. And it's now proving to be a, 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 a platform, hopefully, for policy change. So this is what we found, and it echoed exactly uh, the Harry's Masculinity Report from the previous year, which also John Barry carried out in America with near identical findings. And that was, guess what? Um, people in committed, loving relationships were the happiest. Well, there goes the misogyny theory. It's like, you know, these men that loved women and men who loved men, people who were in love were happy. And this reflected through all areas of their lives. And look at the life satisfaction versus work. I mean, it's almost a mirror image. Quite simply, 
men at work in fulfilling work. And it's key to point out it wasn't just about the amount of money they earned, but the feeling of belonging to something bigger than them, being a part of something meaningful. And that sort of work can take on many forms. And when we explored that, we, we saw a real sense of men wanting to get, kind of get out of their lane, if you like. You know, why can't we have more male teachers, more male carers, more male nurses? There's a real appetite for change out there in these intimate conversations. This is what they look like. So when the, when the AI pulled out words, you can see quite clearly, those who scored their life very highly talked about things like acceptance, achievements, I'm adventurous, and all these words were, were coming out. And then the, the flip side of that was abandoned, abandonment, abuse. And do you know what? Going into that, I used to go into it every morning and look at the fresh conversations that happened overnight. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, it was sometimes really difficult. I'll never forget this um, story of um, a, a squaddy who had PTSD and had never told his wife. And he was slowly drinking himself to death. And he was talking to a piece of fucking software. Sorry to swear. I just need to stop that. I'm a politician now. <laughs> Edit that out. Anyway, but the point is, they felt able to do this because they kept telling us, the software doesn't judge me. I don't need to worry about feeling ashamed. I don't need to worry about feeling fragile or pathetic. Well, all of the barriers that we hear so often are stopping men getting face-to-face -face care, which we know is necessarily the best method of care. They were talking to a piece of software, often at 2, 3 a.m., you know, after a few drinks. And we saw, I think, some of the most incredible conversations that I've ever witnessed. There was one guy who'd been sexually abused as a boy when he was age seven. And he, was in a, he scored 10 out of 10 for his relationship. He was married to a woman he loved. And he'd never told her about his childhood trauma. And all I wanted to do was like, say, well, mate, where are you? Let's just, let's just go for a beer. These are the sort of people that I think we can reach in a new way and use this as, as a bridge, as a way in to try to pull these people in. If they have these initial conversations with software and they're kind of breaking the ice, I kept telling us, this, this is the first time I've talked about this. And actually, yeah, now I feel a bit more ready perhaps to move on and, and have that more meaningful and productive conversation. So I see it as, as, a, as, as a critical icebreaker to helping men take that first step, if you like. Then we asked them about what made them anxious. And look, there's Brexit. <laughs> Brexit is making them feel anxious. I think it was number six. But you see, every day worries. And here it's like the, the role of the male provider is obviously burdensome for a great deal of men, particularly during times of economic hardship, which we know directly feeds into self-harm and male suicide. You know, Joblessness is ex a key driver. Um, as is being separated from your children. Now, it's no wonder if, if, if children is number four. If, if children brings the most, if brings a great sense of happiness, it also carries with it a great sense of burden if they are removed, particularly if, if in a kind of unfair or undemocratic or you know, unequal manner. And you all know about that in this room. Incidentally, the Brexit anxiety was mostly amongst the older people. And it seemed to be people who didn't feel Brexit was ever going to happen in their lives. And that includes my parents, and that's a big reason why I stood to be an MEP. But here's, here's something that I think we should really take note of. More than half of British men felt some sense of burden upon those around them, but of course, they weren't necessarily ready to talk about that. You know, 14% um, sometimes, 32%, a third of men feel a sense of burden. I think that should make us, you know, take note and, and be concerned. But instead of judging these men for being pathetic, for not seeking help, how about saying, well, we can take this conversation to you in a new way. And that's where I think the real opportunity. And here, here's the really, really magically, beautifully encouraging bit. Look at this. Right across the board, we asked them, so what would you like to talk about? 
to a chatbot, a more advanced chatbot that had proper um, intimacy. We think we're about 20 years away from a fully functioning, almost um, bot therapist type of thing. I'm not trying to put you guys out of work. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying, as, as, a, as a complimentary um, first gateway, look at this, mental health, particularly the young lads. I, I love, I can't say I love young lads. What I mean is, <laughs> Time and time again, we're doing these reports, aren't we, John? And we're seeing that the young men are ready for this conversation. There, there is a new openness. There is an emotional readiness, you know, to kind of talk about um, their, their intimate matters, which I think we really, really should signal boost and, and celebrate. Now, they want to talk about their mental health, work, relationships, across the board, career. And so there's all sorts of obvious practical implications you could pull from that straight away. What about a career bot? Now, what about a love bot? Well, we know that men, <laughs> but we know that men get dragged, kicking and screaming to relate, don't they? Oh, I don't, go, don't want to do that. But what about if it was non-judgmental, at least initially? There's tons, you can see loads of obvious scope. It generated massive media interest, and I'm really heartened by that, because this was not something that we offered up. I mean, you can see we're all over Sky News, loads of radio, loads of press pickup, and the, the Times magazine ran a six-page feature, and all they ran were the quotes. They just ran what these men had said in their raw, unedited, cut-and-paste format, and they ran it by decades. So young men were particularly anxious about their physicality, their penis size, their, their, their dateability, their... Their, their score on the Instagram, you know, kind of Tinder you know, anxiety scale. Middle-aged men were anxious about things we know about, parental alienation, separation, job breakdown, divorce. But when we put it out there, the media were receptive because they'd never really heard this before. And I think we need to, like, steal ourselves and remember that even though we may feel that the press is hostile, when you offer them stuff that's, that's original, and more to the point, honest, 100% honest. The editors were, were lapping it up, and we were able to go on the telly, go on the radio, and say, no, just stop knocking men. Like, actually, maybe you're part of the problem, because they're not talking because you keep making them feel like shit, and if we don't do that bit, then they're ready to talk, and here's the proof. So, you know, let's be... Let's be more of a receptive sounding board for, for, men, for men's anxieties as opposed to um, judgmental harridans at The Guardian. Anyway, so what does this mean? Now, I'm an MEP, which is <laughs> mad. I've never done politics in my life. I've talked about it a lot. And the Male Psychology Conference and the Male Psychology Network, I think, is a, is a huge part of my journey to, to being where I am now. Because, you know, it gave, it, I think it gives all of us the feeling that we're not alone. You know, we're, we're working in this space you know, to, to a common goal. It's stuff that matters. And slowly, slowly but surely, policymakers are, are waking up to this. I think it, it was a huge asset to have Jackie Doyle Price along earlier. You know, the mental health minister you know, wouldn't have come near anything like this two or three years ago. Let's be frank about that. You know, it's like, it, you can say it's tick box, but I, I, I want to be glass half full about this. I think it's an amazing thing. You know, whoever got, got her along, well done. You know, it's, it's a great moment. And I was able to give her the, the report. So this is the report of that AI work, the Harry's AI work. And, and it's particularly poignant to me. Um, Mark Brooks, who's here, um, he, he wrote for it. John Barry wrote for it. Martin Seeger wrote for it. So this is the coming together of people in this room in the men's network, who wrote a powerful document, which is also, sadly, and this is a bit where I need to keep my emotions in check, a friend of mine, Pete Cashmore, who, who committed suicide um, after um, writing in this. Uh, he didn't make it. But Pete... Fuck. But Pete, he, he, he used this bot... Pete had a, he had a bipolar condition, extreme depression, substance abuse for many years. He, he worked for me on Loaded Magazine. I gave him his first job in, in the media. Um, he lived really near to me, just down the road. And um, I, I knew that he'd been through a lot of anxiety, a lot of pain. And, you know, he, he tried to kill himself numerous times. And in the end, 
he succeeded. Pete Cashmore used this, and he said it was better than half the therapists that he'd ever been assigned to. Better in his term, in as far as he had that burden, he had that barrier of, of being open, but he didn't have that with, with the bot. And, and I said, you know, I made Pete a little promise that, that I'll get this document done and get it to the, <laughs> the, the minister. And we did, today, here. We did it here. And that is why I just want to say thank you, you know, you know to everyone that puts this on and, and allows us to do this, because this, this work matters. Like all of you, all of you people doing this stuff, I want, I want to thank you for being a part of it. And I'm going to Brussels in a few weeks. I've got a job I don't want. <laughs> I don't want to be an MEP, but nevertheless, I will bear that cross. What I want to do is some meaningful work. I don't want to be accused of being a, a sitting at the back, dicking around, you know, non-attendee. And over the next couple of weeks, we're we're trying to get onto into a group, which means we can get onto committees. And I would like to infiltrate, sorry, I'd like to join the Women and Equalities Committee in Brussels, who, by the way, hardly do any work on equality. <laughs> and I would like to take a lot of the work that we all do here into Europe, where the situation is pretty much the same. Look at, look at youth unemployment in Spain, in Greece, and all these countries that, that really under the cosh, where men seem to have been utilized and forgotten and thrown to one side. You know, we can have some meaningful conversations and think, do some meaningful work and, and, and get people to listen. And we have the intellectual prowess to do that. In this room, there's, practically everybody's more intelligent than me. I'm just the mug who can talk on a stage. So, so let's pull together. That's my email address. You know, if, if, you, if you think there's a good idea, like the pre, you know, what you just did a minute ago, oh, you've been talking about European education, you know, pan-global best practice for, for years. It should be heard. It should be heard out there. And it's up to us to do that. And I'll just, I'll just finish off now, because I know you're kind of gagging for a glass of wine. <laughs> I'll finish off now by just once again saying, you know, the Male Psychology Conference and the Male Psychology Network is massively important. You know, things like this, you know, truly give a platform and they give us permission. Because don't we all feel a little bit sort of ashamed or are we allowed to? Yes, we are. We are allowed to talk about men and boys' issues. And by, by coming together in place like this, I think we can make a huge difference. So thanks for having me, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Cheers.